Okay, so I want to talk today about pathways to healthy aging um, and how lifestyle, genetics, and environment interact to promote resilience against Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to be telling you about our work at Rutgers Newark from the Aging and Brain Health Alliance. And we chose the word alliance for two reasons. One, it, it captures the fact that we are an alliance across multiple departments, multiple campuses, including the uh, medical school, as well as with some of our foreign and, and external collaborators at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and UC Irvine. But more importantly, we're an alliance with the community and the community members and organizations and churches that we work with. And so I want to tell you a bit about what we are doing with this alliance and some of what we've learned. So we have dual missions. The first mission is community engagement for public health. We, we run programs on brain health and Alzheimer's prevention for African Americans in the greater Newark area. And two, neuroscience research, interdisciplinary university community research to advance our understanding of aging, brain health, and Alzheimer's disease. And I want to start by telling you about our community engagement programs, our local program, and then how that leads into the research. Let me start with some definitions because people often get confused about the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a disease that destroys our brain. It gets worse over time. It's a very specific disease with specific pathology at the cellular level. The early symptoms are forgetting what was just said or done in the last five or 10 minutes, getting lost. Um, these begin, that they grow progressively. When their symptoms are so bad that they prevent someone from living independently, we say they have dementia. So the distinction is dementia is a symptom. It can be caused by many things, Parkinson's, HIV, uh, dehydration, and so forth. Alzheimer's is a specific disease that can cause this symptom. Why focus on African Americans? The reasons are threefold. As compared to white Americans, African Americans are over twice as likely to get Alzheimer's disease, significantly less likely to seek and receive treatment for Alzheimer's and other dimensions, and third, over 50% less likely to participate in biomedical research on aging and Alzheimer's disease. And these three issues are really the targets for our community engagement from the Aging and Brain Health Alliance. And our goals in the community in, in, in Newark and in Essex County are threefold. We wanna reduce the rate of Alzheimer's. We wanna increase the treatment that people receive when they do have dementia. And we wanna increase the rate at which African-Americans in the Newark area participate in research. Um, oops, where is that? Um, where is that, sorry. Sorry, I may look to there. Uh, we've been working for uh, 16 years um, doing in community partnerships and uh, a wide range of programs in the community at Rutgers. And uh, I have, a, at this point, a very robust community engagement team, some of whom are, are online now. Um, it's run by two of my postdoctoral fellows, Darling Tina Esiaka, originally from Nigeria, and Joss Gills, who is joining us tomorrow um, as his first day of work. Um, and the two of them together oversee two arms to our engagement program, recruitment. Um, and we have three members of the community, uh, a reverend, a pastor who runs our church programs, a longtime housing advocate, Glenda Wright, who, does, who works with public housing and the Rick Housing Authority, and Catherine Willis, who I've seen is, is joining us today, who assists both of them in outreach to, each orange, to, to, to East Orange. Once we get people into our study, which I'll tell you about later, a critical issue is retention. And Dolores Hammonds, who's been with me for, I think, at least six years, if not more, she does a wide variety of, of things in our program, but she's particularly responsible for retention. That means she's consenting participants um, um, so that we call the IR, we call the sort of the consent form, the, the Rubicon of trust. Unless Dolores can get them across that, uh, nothing else happens. She trains all of our RAs in cultural humility so that she feels comfortable with them going out. And she runs our very important participant or VIP program, which helps retain people long term in our study. Uh, we have a number of graduate students across uh, many of them in public health. I have a courtesy appointment in public health because a lot of public health students work with me. Immunology, we have undergraduates um, and two faculty, junior faculty, who work with us to sort of build their own research programs within our, uh, our broader uh, infrastructure. I Let me let on tell you an event. Bit. There's always something to learn. My enjoyment is to see the residents that are really in the underdeserved population. My enjoyment is to see them come and to see them learn about Alzheimer's. This type of event is so necessary for all of us because maybe one day 
we can put Alzheimer's behind us. Um, our community brain health programs have really six very simple messages, exercise, challenge your brain, manage stress, get a good night's sleep, socialize with others, eat a healthy diet. Um, that's the, the basic message. Uh, we run programs in the community called Aging Smart that, that we do at churches, at senior centers, at public housing. Uh, we produce two uh, brochures, uh, two materials. We have a six steps to a better memory which has been distributed that basically takes those six steps and explains them in detail. There's also a refrigerator magnet that has them summarized. Um, we are launching actually as of this week, it just was published today, um, a new newsletter. Uh, with the, the one that Diane mentioned is an old one. We have a new one called Aging and Brain Health. It'll come out three times a year. It's a four page newsletter. It gets distributed to all our participants, to all 40 or some odd churches and uh, all around the community and we'll also mail it nationally. So it's, it's a ways in which we sort of will be our sort of public base for presenting information about brain health to the community at a level that's accessible. Um, we're particularly interested in exceptional African-American superagers, those who are 80 and above with superior cognitive ability. We think of them as role models for healthy aging and we both honor, as you can see, we had a, a, a big ceremony honoring them um, in the brochure at the left and the, and the photo below. Um, and we study them as long distance memory athletes because they help help us learn what we can, uh, how we can all aspire to be 80 or 90 and be as cognitively vital as they are. Um, recruiting men is a struggle um, and uh, it's always been a struggle because men, men we believe we're invulnerable and we know everything. So health and education are things that don't often attract men, um, of all men. We run special programs for men and tomorrow you're all invited. You'll notice the date is Saturday. We have an annual classic car show and health fair um, it's being taking place in East Orange. We're gonna have lots of cars, free lunch, free music, free dancing, um, and uh, about 18 different health vendors preventing information and free testing to the community. So it's our major annual men's event because there are big sex differences between men and women in aging and Alzheimer's. And unless we recruit enough men, we won't be able to sort of study those rigorously. So we're having a, a classic car show and men's brain health fair combined for the first time here at Rutgers University Newark. And the purpose is to reach out to men who traditionally don't come to health education events with local churches with their men's ministries. There's a lot of the fellas within the community that are, um, are interested in, in, in old cars, new cars. They have mechanical uh, inclinations. So uh, we use a little trickery, like the, the car show here, and then say, okay, well, look here, there's a doctor over there. Why don't you go uh, get a blood pressure exam? So that's, that's from 2017, and uh, we'll have another one tomorrow. We also do small programs at local churches during COVID, dur during the height of the pandemic, we work with local pastors. Um, we all became immunologists uh, very quickly to sort of do health education. Um, with a local pastor, with our director of church relations, I've written a, a Bible study guide, 10 practical tips from brain science for memorizing scripture. And we have pastors on our team who go out and do these this program at Bible study groups at Wednesdays at local churches. So we try to bring the neuroscience and the health information to the community in a context that's useful to them. And we can think of it. Let's see if we can get lots of girls. Let's go Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I was asked to take care of my grandmother. I went to take care of her. I took care of her every day. So that's some of the fun that we have. Um, we have now about close to 40 churches, 13 public housing sites, and about half a dozen health organizations who are members of our stakeholders board. And all of them sign, as do I, a memorandum of understanding so that we know what to expect of them and they know what to expect of us. So. We were very big on sort of trying to promote and clarify transparency. So let me give you a bit of a summary about what's going on with our, our public health and community engagement. A community engagement team with deep roots in the community is essential. And we have many such people who've been in the community all their life for 50, 60, 70 years. Regular programming that brings value to the community and builds on familiarity with our research team. So we have our community team, but our research team is also in the community. So people recognize them. A community stakeholders board with written MOU gives partners a voice and establishes a commitment to transparency. 
And with appropriate engagement, community engagement, older African Americans will enroll in research on aging and brain health. Um, and that's uh, really one of the things that's been very exciting that we've been able to do. And I think in many ways set a, uh, an example for a lot of other aging centers around the country about how to increase enrollment of African Americans. And it enables us then to look work on our second mission, which is to do interdisciplinary study and research on aging brain health and Alzheimer's prevention. There are three key knowledge gaps which motivate our work. First, we need new measures of cognition and brain function that can detect the earliest, that is the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease. We need a better understanding of how genetics and modifiable lifestyle factors interact to determine who is at highest risk for Alzheimer's and B, which interventions will have the greatest impact on which people for reducing risk. We're all about sort of early prediction and identification. And from that early prediction, being able to intervene early to prevent Alzheimer's. And lastly, we need to ensure that the advances in early detection and in optimized interventions are applicable to populations at high risk, especially African-Americans. So this leads us to our study, which we call Pathways to Healthy Aging in African-Americans, a university community collaboration. Since 2015, we've enrolled over 400 local African-Americans from greater Newark, um, over 350 into our longitudinal study. Most are at high risk for Alzheimer's due to having one or more of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, poor sleep, and poor fitness. Each of these alone increases your risk, some of them doubling your risk for Alzheimer's. In the community, most people have at least one, if not more, of these risk factors. Who is eligible to participate? Who do we enroll? So anyone who identifies as African-American or Black, age 60 or older, speak English fluently, but we do not enroll people who already have dementia or memory impairments. We're about studying healthy aging and how to prevent Alzheimer's. What do the participants do in the study? Um, our protocol has grown over the years. As our folks in the IRB know, we're constantly sending them updates. Um, day one now is th about 30 minutes. It's at the medical school at the clinical research unit. We take saliva for genetics and blood tests for brain health, immune health, diabetes, and so forth. Then they come back another day and they do two and a half hours of cognitive testing um, that I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. They do health, fitness, and lifestyle assessments. Um, and then they come back the third day for brain imaging. So it's really three days. Sometimes we combine it into two if they're coming from a distance. There's an optional week of home sleep monitoring. I'll talk about the importance of that later. And people can earn up to $200 plus a transportation allowance. So we, make, we, we, we show people the respect of paying them uh, for their time. And then we repeat every two years or every one year once people reach the age of 80. So that makes it the longitudinal study. We're not just bringing them in once. It's why retention is so important, not just recruitment, because we want people to stay with us for two, four, or six years or more. There are a number of individual health benefits besides the money we pay people. Um, we do screening for diabetes. We're going to be adding cholesterol testing soon as well. If people show positive and they're not aware of it, we can uh, guide them. With people's permission, we can provide copies of brain scans and other health tests to a participant's doctor. And that's why some of the local health clinics, um, particularly Salerno Medical Associates, promotes this as a free Rutgers brain check because we can do the equivalent of thousands of dollars of diagnostic testing that insurance would never cover because people are healthy now. And these, these brain imaging and everything else are useful for early monitoring as well as providing a baseline in case there are health problems in, in the end. So this is really one of the the great individual benefits. Um, and then if on future visits, two, four, six years from initial enrollment, people do begin to show decline in possible dementia, then we pay for a complete and rigorous test. We don't pay for treatment, but we will pay for the, uh, the screening and the testing. So let me summarize just what the Pathways study is. The Rutgers Pathway to Healthy Aging and African American Study is longitudinal, enrolls African Americans, 16 above, who are healthy at the time of enrollment, cognitively healthy. Three days of testing, broad, extensive, we call it a sort of a deep phenotype. We really want to capture all aspects of them, their health and their cognition. Um, there are many health and educational benefits and financial benefits. So what have we discovered so far from this? So what I want to do now is show you a peek of a few of the most exciting discoveries that we've had here at Rutgers. I said there are three knowledge gaps, and this will sort of organize some of the, uh, the findings. Um, we need new measures of cognition as well as brain function. Let me tell you about some of the new cognitive measures that we developed. So we have a novel Rector's generalization task. These are helping identify early cognitive decline 
years, five or 10 years before dementia sets in. So five or 10 years before somebody gets dementia, we're picking up some of these subtle cognitive changes. And that's important because by the time someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, 80% of the brain damage has already occurred. So when you say, oh, you know, my, my dad, my somebody just got diagnosed with Alzheimer's, they, they didn't just get Alzheimer's. They're 80% of the way through the disease and their brain looks a little bit like that, okay? The real issue is you wanna get people, when we know, we need to know early, 15 or 20 years early, when the disease starts, when the brain is still healthy so that we can keep it that way. What we've discovered is that the earliest cognitive changes are not to memory loss, the standard sort of deficits that you see when someone has diagnosed Alzheimer's, but rather a loss of the ability to flexibly apply, that is to generalize learning from one context to another. So what do we mean by generalization? Generalization is the transfer of past learning to new situations. So we have here uh, Plato, first time Plato got uh, broccoli, it made him sick. So he avoided it in the future. That was a really easy thing to learn. Broccoli makes me sick. But what happens the first time he saw cauliflower? Is he gonna eat cauliflower or avoid it? It's not exactly broccoli, but it looks a little bit similar. And this is the challenge of generalization, to take what we've learned in the past and apply it to things that may be similar in one or another ways, but are different. The Rutgers generalization task we've shown over the last 20 years are really critical at a way of seeing the cognitive changes that are happening many years before dementia. Let me show you a bit about their like. This is not the whole task, but it gives you the flavor for some of what goes on in, in one of our tasks. We have several tasks. We call this concurrent discrimination and transfer. So early on, there'll be a, a, a choice where people have to try to figure out where's the hidden smiley face. They'll guess at first. Eventually they'll learn that the hidden smiley face is under the red octagon. So red octagon is, is correct compared to yellow octagon. They learn that fine. But later on, they see something they've never seen before. Okay, it's a red cross and a yellow cross. They've never seen this, but if they extracted the rule that red beats yellow and ignored irrelevant shape, they'll get this correctly. So this is a way we test people's ability to generalize past learning to novel challenges. These Rutgers generalization tests are new cognitive markers for detecting early cognitive decline towards future Alzheimer's disease long before standard neuropsychological measures of memory are able to detect any benefits. Which leads us to ask, where and how does the brain give us the ability to generalize past learning to new challenges? And this gets us to the question of brain function. What are the measures of brain function that will pick up some of the earliest changes when we wanna make interventions? The hippocampus has, is a key structure for memory. It's part of a region of the brain called the medial temporal lobe that's in the middle over the ears and inside. It's all, long been known to be key for storing new memories. And that's why people who have severe damage to the hippocampus can no longer store new memories. Old memories can be fine. They remember their childhood. They just don't remember what you or they said 10 minutes ago. Um, back in 1993, uh, two year, uh, we developed two years after I arrived here, um, a computational model, a sort of an artificial intelligence model of the hippocampus. And that's what's really led to all of these scientific findings since then, has been taking this theory, this computational theory, and applying it to a broad range of disorders that involve the hippocampus, including Alzheimer's disease. Damage to the hippocampus, we showed, impairs generalization. So if you have damage to the hippocampus, you can learn broccoli makes you sick. You just can't learn, know what to do about cauliflower. What changes in the hippocampus in the early stages of Alzheimer's to impair generalization? And that's been one of our latest findings. And I'll, I'll explain it uh, without any of the mathematical details, but instead by a metaphor. So imagine two parties, and I want you to think, which party would you rather go to? A stimulating cocktail party. Throughout the evening, groups of people come together, chat about topics, then break off and form other groups and talk about different topics. Um, if you're an extrovert like me, this is heaven, okay? You've got a bunch of people at a party and throughout the evening, you're joining different groups and talking to different people. It's a very dynamic um, party. Imagine instead another party, a dinner party. You're stuck next to the same people all evening long, okay? And you talk to the same person throughout the evening as you see schematized here. The same groups of people are talking to each other, okay? That's sort of a boring dinner party. It's a very static party. Now, those two metaphors describe what we think are happening in a healthy or a dementing brain, okay? That the connectivity in the medial temporal lobe, the early hippocampus is, in a healthy brain, these different subregions are connecting and reconnecting, disconnecting, 
They're dynamically flexible. That's healthy. However, we see that as people begin to decline towards dementia, as their generalization gets impaired, these this, this dynamic flexibility is lost and the brain connectivity becomes rigid. And so our second main finding is that this dynamic connectivity is an innovative new network marker developed by our team at Rutgers Newark in the last few years that uses resting state fMRI at the Rubik Brain Imaging Center to evaluate brain circuits in the medial temporal lobe that are disrupted in early prodromal, that means preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So one of our future directions is to evaluate this task to predict long-term decline. So it's one thing to, as I said, it's a longitudinal study. It's one thing to know what's, what's, what relates to what cross-sectionally, but what's really important is to predict what's gonna happen in the future. We have some preliminary pilot data and we show that uh, on the left end A, poor generalization performance, that is high errors, predicts episodic memory decline. Episodic memory is what they're testing for when they diagnose you for dementia and that low dynamic flexibility also predicts decline. So we see here the beginning of evidence that these cognitive and neural markers are predicting changes later on in the kinds of measures that are used to diagnose dementia. Let me turn to the second knowledge gap. We need to better understand how genetics and modifiable lifestyle factors interact and how we can decide who, who will benefit most from which interventions. Why do some people get Alzheimer's disease and not others? Well, there are three answers to that question. Lifestyle, risk factors include obesity, diabetes, hypertension, poor sleep, and being sedentary. Genetics, some genes can either increase or decrease your risk for Alzheimer's. And it's important to note that these genetics for Alzheimer's differ by racial background. So the idea is it's not so much necessarily the case that the genes uh, for one race are more or less important. It's just that there are different sets of genes than those of African ancestry versus those of European ancestry that are associated with uh, Alzheimer's risk. And finally, environment, your social and physical environment, including stress, noise, and pollution can affect your risk. All three of these interact in complex ways to determine an individual's risk for Alzheimer's, but only one of these, number one, are you able to change. And so our real interest is in the number one, the lifestyle, because that's where we have the greatest potential for change. Now, I wanna circle here, interact in complex ways, because there's a common misconception that when we talk about nature nurture, which is basically you know, genetics versus lifestyle and environment, that these have sort of a fix. You can say, well, it's 40% genetics and 60% lifestyle or 60% this and 30% that. Well, these sorts of statements about this percent genetics and this percent lifestyle uh, make an erroneous assumption, which is that these things are independent of each other, that you can look at the risk from one and add it to the risk for the other. What I'm gonna show you is that for Alzheimer's, in fact, these different risk factors interact in very complex ways that are much more subtle than uh, just the idea that there's 1% from one and 1% from the other. And lastly, I wanna highlight the racial backgrounds, why it's so important to look at all of these issues, not just genetics, but lifestyle and environment in different racial backgrounds because the genetics are gonna be different. The current research in our lab is now focusing on interactions between genetics and lifestyle. Um, and we have three main questions. One is how does genetics moderate individual differences in how aerobic fitness predicts cognition? How does genetics moderate individual differences in how cardio exercise interventions change cognition? And how and in whom can sleep protect against Alzheimer's disease? So let me describe each of them in turn. I'll start with the first, genetics and fitness. Let me tell you about a gene called ABCA7. It affects the transport of proteins in the brain including those that are associated with amyloid beta or A beta, which is the hallmark cellular pathology of Alzheimer's. There are two SNPs, SNPs, um, which are variations at different places in the gene. One, which is the more, more commonly known, is called ABCA780. It's specific to African descent. The risk allele is rarely found in those of European. In those of African descent, it is uh, one of the two most important genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's. Having the risk variant doubles someone's risk for getting Alzheimer's, okay? Um, the other is ABCA750. This is a risk allele that's found across races, um, especially in women. And historically, it was not given much attention because it has only a very modest impact directly. Uh, people with the ABCA750 risk variant only have about a 20% increase. But I wanna tell you about some of the novel findings that we have about this ABCA750 gene. 
and, and it gets back to fitness. How do we measure physical fitness? We do a six minute walk. We ask how far can participants walk in six minutes? And this measures and approximates their maximal oxygen com consumption, what's often called their VO2 max. Now, when we first looked at the analyses, we looked at all the standard measures of neuropsychological cognition. These are the measures that if you go to a dementia clinic and they wanna see if you have dementia, they'll look at your ability delayed recall, they'll look at something called your mini mental, they'll look at your digit span. Okay, these are the three of the most standard, common, off the shelf measures of cognition that go on at a doctor's office. What you see here is although we're always told that fitness is good in these otherwise healthy people, different levels of fitness has no effect on these standard measures. But when we look at our generalization tasks, the ones that we've argued are much more sensitive to the changes that happen 15 or 20 years before you get dementia, um, here we begin to see an effect. Here we see the physical fitness, um, the more fit people are, the better they do at generalization, okay? But it's, that isn't true of everyone. You see, there are a lot of counterexamples. Not everybody who is in this graph who's fit is doing well on generalization. So there's a trend, but it's, it's significant, but it's not that strong. But we can distinguish, however, between why is it working in some? Why are some people benefiting from exercise, from fitness, and not others? And that brings us back to this ABCA, ABCA 750 gene. What we've shown is if we separate people by having the risk or the non-risk phenotype, we see something very striking. All the non-risk, all the people with the risk genotype, they showed essentially no advantage to fitness, very, very mild effect. The non-risk genotype, however, there's a very strong and significant effect. And so what this is showing us here is that the effects of fitness really depend on having the right gene. So it's not enough just to be fit, you have to be fit and have the right genotype. Um, there is some small benefit for those in the risk genotype, and it suggests that perhaps for those people, they need to go to the gym twice as often as everyone else. So there's more details on this um, in a paper we published for those who are interested. So let me summarize um, what we've seen here. One, in cognitively healthy older African-Americans, carriers of the risk variant of ABCA750 show a strong correlation between fitness and generalization but not on the standard neuropsych test of memory. In contrast, those with the risk variant showed no significant advantage of being fit. The implication then is that this risk genotype may diminish the neuroprotective value of fitness. So we're just gonna to try to sort of put this all together into a schematic. We know that uh, the brain being healthy improves cognition and lowers Alzheimer's. We've always we've known for a long time that fitness improves brain function. What we've learned now is that the, the relationship between fitness and brain function is modulated, moderated by this gene. Which leads us to ask, does this gene also impact the effects of exercise on cognition? So before I showed you a cross-sectional finding across everyone on, their, on one visit, what happens if between two visits, six months apart, we get some of the people to exercise intensely? So that is, can we help these people? Look at the lower left corner. These are the people from the original graph who have low physical fitness and are poor generalization. Can we improve their function by making them more fit? And that leads us to the second uh, of our research studies. How does genetics moderate individual differences in how exercise changes cognition? So our method is we have the same fitness, the same assessments I described before. We did a five month dance based aerobic exercise program, it was twice a week, it was held at local churches, and then we reassessed everybody after the intervention. This was the work that was funded uh, by the New Jersey Department of Health's Office of Minority and Multicultural uh, Programs. Um, so to better understand our exercise, when I, when I do this live in front of an audience, I, I ask everybody to stand up. Since you're all out in Zoom land, we'll just do it on your own if you feel like it. This is what uh, one minute of this five month exercise looks like. So that gives you a sense of what this is, what, what this is like. Uh, as predicted, oh, after a 20 week exercise intervention, twice a week, only the carriers of the low risk genotype showed the cognitive improvements. So if you look here, the control group, those are people who just went about their life as normal. There was no, they, they just were people who we enrolled and matched, but weren't in the exercise. Among those in the exercise group, those in the high risk genotype showed no significant advantage. 
those in the low risk genotype showed a huge improvement. They, they reduced their generalization errors. So low is good here. So because we're looking at errors. So a very striking finding that's consistent with what we saw cross-sectionally. Uh, this was just presented in a paper in 2020. So to summarize this result, older sedentary African-Americans, we only enrolled people who were sedentary, who weren't exercising, with the high risk variant of the 50 gene show much less cognitive benefit from this five month, twice a week exercise intervention than those with the low risk genotype. And the implication is that different people with different genetic variations may require different prescriptions of exercise interventions to improve cognition and reduce risk for Alzheimer's disease. So now we know that it's not just fitness, but also exercise as an intervention, which is being moderated by this ABCA750 gene. One which I should point out has only a very modest direct effect. It's only when you look at it indirectly on these lifestyle variables do you see the effect. So how does exercise rewire our brains and improve cognition? So these people are doing better after exercising. What's actually changing in their brains? So our result is, and we, this is again that, that, that network flexibility, remember the fun cocktail party versus the boring dinner party. That's the measure we're using here. And what we see is that after this five months exercise, those people in the control condition, their, their, their flexibility was the same. But those in the exercise intervention, post-exercise showed a big increase in the dynamic flexibility in their hippocampal region. So we, we see that that suggests that exercise isn't only improving cognition, but it's also improving uh, this flexibility. Now you might ask, well, how are they related? Is it really the case that improving this flexibility is what's causing the improvement in cognition. And so there we look at linking brain changes to cognitive improvement. And what we see is across both groups, both the intervention group and the control participants, increasing neural flexibility was associated with increasing cognitive performance. And so here are the, the orange dots of the people who are in the exercise intervention, the, uh, the blue, the blue uh, diamonds are the ones with the control. And we see generalization errors on the bottom, and flexibility on the left. Uh, and so let's look in the upper left corner. That's the good corner. That's where you want to be. That means few errors and high flex, improving in flex. That means you're getting, you're reducing the errors and you're improving flexibility. And you'll notice that in that quadrant there, almost everybody is the exercise people. There are some people who are in the control condition. Maybe they just went out and did some exercise. We, you know, we weren't following them. They both improved their flexibility and they uh, reduced their errors. But the really scary corner is the next corner, the lower right, that's the bad corner. These are participants um, who got worse over five months. As you'll note, most of those um, are in the control condition. And what's scary is that five months of not exercising and there's already a significant deficit and decline in cognition and brain flexibility. So for those of you who are saying, well, I'll start my exercise in six months, that's what can be happening in just five months, that decline in the control condition. Again, for those interested, this is uh, available and all these papers are available on our website. So to summarize, exercise promotes medial temporal lobe flexibility, and this may prevent increases in synchronicity, that is rigidity across subregions, and this protects against cognitive decline. So now um, we see that it's not just that fitness and, and exercise are improving the brain, it's in particular, it's improving the flexibility of the networks in the hippocampus. Um, this is the story that got a lot of media attention because it was some of the first data that showed us how exercise is enhancing brain. We've, we've known that exercise is good. Now we know who it's good for, which people are better for than others, and how it's reorganizing the brain. What are some of our future directions? Um, starting this fall, we are anticipating a new NIA award. It was ranked in the top 6%. It's been recommended for funding and we're, we're working with Christina now on all of the just-in-time IRB and so forth, uh, although it hasn't actually been awarded. This is gonna be a, a clinical trial. Now, what, why does the clinical trial differ than what we did? Well, the first is there's an active comparator group. So we're gonna compare 24 weeks, so a longer intervention, um, and it's gonna be three times a week, which is the recommended level. So it's longer and it's more times a week. And we're gonna compare people randomly assigned to either cardio dance fitness, which is what we did before, or a strength and flexibility and balance. Both of these are good interventions. Both of these are good, um, but we wanna know how they differ. And we'll look at how they, and the aims are to look at how they affect generalization, how it affects um, uh, flexibility, how ABCA750 is varying it. And really importantly, we're gonna look at 
how is this uh, affecting the actual pathology? So our collaborate with our collaborators in Sweden, we're doing blood draws. They're able to measure through the blood the levels of these Alzheimer's, this amyloid metal pathology. And the question is, and this is a big unanswered question in the field, we know exercise is good. Um, it, we know it reduces the risk for Alzheimer's. What we don't know is, is exercise actually improving it? Is it reducing the levels of this pathology? Is it maybe just slowing it down? Or is it the case that exercise has no effect on the underlying pathology and all of its benefits are compensatory, that it's just creating cognitive and neural reserve, but not affecting the underlying disease? That's a big open question, and it's one that we hope to answer with this study. So let me finally turn to sleep. Um, how and in whom can sleep protect against Alzheimer's disease? Um, go back to this ABCA7 slide. Remember I mentioned that the ABCA780 is a direct predictor of Alzheimer's. It increases if you have the risk version. In African, it's only seen in African-Americans or those of African descent. It doubles their risk for, for Alzheimer's. What can we do about it? Um, so in earlier work, we had shown that older African-Americans with this risk allele showed impaired generalization, um, showed more sort of rigid brain networks um, and worse connectivity. So we've already shown earlier that in our population, in our cohort, a wide variety of cognitive and neural deficits. So the question is, what can protect that? Can sleep protect the brain health in these people? Um, so to study this, we took 57 carriers of the high risk genotype. Those are the people with double the risk for Alzheimer's overall, and 57 who we matched on age, education, and weight. And what we see here is that there's a direct impact of ABCA7 risk genotype, poor cognition and lower flexibility. So we basically replicated with some of our newer tools what we had seen before, namely that the people with the high risk, that's the blue, show more generalization errors, um, and they show uh, uh, less flexible, okay? Um, so if we look now, um, so what that confirms across many studies is that this ABCA780 is bad for flexibility and hence bad for cognition. But now if we look at people's self-reported sleep, we see that eliminates the disparity. So if we separate the generalization errors, okay? And remember here, high is bad. If we separate it by people just graded their sleep, it's a very simple. Um, in fact, I never thought it would even work because I don't really trust people's self-report. But when they rated their sleep as poor, average, or good, the people with good sleep, there was no difference, okay? Even in the high-risk group and the low-risk group, there was no difference there, okay? Same thing with this network dynamic, the, the fMRI measures, that the people who were self-reported good sleep, the differences disappear. People with poor sleep, you see the differences, okay? So that's really important because it says that this risk factors, it's the, it, it along with one other gene are the two most important genetic risk factors in African-Americans for Alzheimer's. We've shown that people in high quality sleep that it eliminates the deficit due to this gene. So the genetics isn't necessarily a sort of, you know, writ in stone. You can modify it with a particular lifestyle variation, sleep quality. Uh, furthermore, in some pilot longitudinal data, we're just beginning now to bring people back for their year, their second year or their fourth year return, in the high risk carriers, those are the people with red, um, high quality sleep eliminated the two year decline in RAVEL. RAVEL is sort of a standard measure of memory in those with poor quality sleep. So the idea is that those with good quality sleep, okay, had no difference between high and low risk. So again, it's further evidence that not only is sleep improving their cognition now, but it's reducing their risk. Um, for uh, what happens in two years or four years. So sleep is good. I encourage everyone to sleep. I hope to put some of you to sleep with this talk until you take a nap afterwards. So let me summarize. The ABCA7 gene doubles the risk for Alzheimer's in older African-Americans, um, and it's associated with poor cognition and brain network health. In our new paper, which is unpublished, about to be submitted, good quality self-reported sleep can eliminate both the cognitive and the neural consequences of this risk gene. And preliminary data suggests that high quality sleep um, can prevent this decline in these risk carriers. Now I emphasize self-reported. I said, I generally don't really believe anything anybody tells me um, and I don't put a lot, you know, but, and yet nevertheless, despite the fact that it's a very simple self-report, we got very robust finding. 
Clearly, however, there are a lot better ways, more objective ways, more rigorous ways to measure sleep. And that's really where we're moving now. Um, this shows a, a device we're using, it's called the Dream System. It has multiple EEG sensors around the head. So we're measuring uh, and an accelerometer, which measures movement um, and a pulse sensor. So we're really capturing a huge amount of data. We're not just measuring how much do you think you slept? How much did you sleep? We're looking at the microstructure of sleep, the brain waves that are happening. And this is Dolores demonstrating it. And people were able to tolerate it quite well. We have them sleep for several days to a week with it. So a future direction. And for those of you in, uh, uh, in, in grant processing, a, a potentially a fall grant uh, proposal, depending on pilot data, is in older African-Americans, is high quality sleep neuroprotective against the neural, cognitive neural and neuropathological markers of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Again, we want to look at the pathology, the blood measures of this. Um, and our aims are to identify not just good sleep or bad sleep, but the stages of sleep, the properties of sleep, the brain waves, which are most predictive of these changes in Alzheimer's risk, and to ask to what degree um, are these uh, risk factors being changed in those who are have this high-risk genotype. What do we know? So let me summarize now and say, well, from all of this, what do we know about the genetics and how lifestyle behaviors that we didn't know before? What's new? What's from what we began working in 2015. So this is the big picture. I've been building it incrementally rather than throwing at it to you all at once, but this is where we are. We know that uh, the improvements in cognition and generalization and the reduction in Alzheimer's risk depend on this hippocampal flexibility. We know that these two genes affect it and they interact with lifestyle in different ways. And I wanna emphasize the complexities of how they interact. If we look here, this is a gene that has a direct effect and it's being modulated by a lifestyle. So direct effect of the gene modulated by lifestyle. In contrast with this other SNP, the same gene, but it's a different uh, nucleotide, we have an indirect effect of the gene on, on a lifestyle behavior that has a direct effect. So again, this sort of emphasizes that um, the genetics and lifestyle behaviors interact in very complex ways to determine people's individual risk. It's not just 50% genetics, 50% lifestyle. So let me summarize what we've learned now on these three key knowledge gaps, which is what set us off on this uh, journey. We need new measures of cognition and brain function to detect the earliest phase, because that's where we need to intervene, okay? The Rutgers generalization tasks are new markers that have proven very robust in predicting cognitive decline long before the standard measures. And this dynamic network connectivity that we developed within the medial temporal lobe um, is turning out to be the neural substrates of these generalization tasks and an fMRI marker that we can use to look at changes. The second guess, we need to understand how genetics interacts and which interventions have the greatest impact on which people. The ABCA 750 risk genotype diminishes the value of aerobic exercise. Um, and they show less cognitive benefit. Um, exercise promotes flexibility and may promote, prevent increases in the rigidity across subregions, protecting against cognitive decline. And high quality sleep can offset or potentially even eliminate the cognitive and neural deficits associated with this other ABCA780 risk variant, which as I noted is the strongest genetic predictor of Alzheimer's in those of African descent. And the last is we need to ensure that advances in early detection and advances in early optimized interventions are applicable to populations who need it most. Those who are at the highest risk, especially African-Americans, and that applies to everything that we're doing. So you might ask, is that all? Are you working on anything else? Um, are there any new grants that we're gonna be submitting in the fall? Um, so one other direction is, I mentioned environment is a third aspect of Alzheimer's risk. We're very interested, we're working with uh, Alejandro Santana in the School of Criminal Justice to look at the role of uh, environmental impact of social deprivation. And in particular, we're trying to expand the methodologies that have been used for studying social determinants of health by, look, by developing and assessing um, what's a novel measure of neighborhood disadvantage, which is spatial proximity to violent crime. And our prediction is that a hyperlocal, namely a 200 foot radius, that's about one fair block of proximity to violent crime will be a measure of sort of the, the, the role of environment of, of neighborhood, much better than the standard. So the standard approach um, for many years in health and Alzheimer's promoted by NIH, as to use measures that are based on census tracts. And those are fine across the country, 
But within a census tract is relatively large in an urban environment like Newark, where five blocks can take you from a really good area to an area you don't want to be. And so this shows from five of our participants in a particularly uh, dangerous area, this shows each of the blue circles is 200 feet around their home. The red dots are violent crime reported by the Newark Police Department. All of this is possible, of course, only through the kind of geospatial tagging that's now possible with the uh, tech mapping technologies. And you can see that in this particular neighborhood, people range from having zero crime incidents to five crime incidents in the last five years. Um, what's going on here? Why is that um, there? Um, what we've seen is that this violent crime proximity is predicting generalization errors. The more violent crime that you have nearby you, literally on your block, the more errors you make. And we compare that to the standard, again, off the shelf measure that NIH has been developing, which is called the Area Deprivation Index. It's an aggregate that describes everybody in a census tract. We see that these Area Deprivation Index doesn't tell you anything. So in a dense urban environment um, like Newark, these hyperlocal measures that come from data supplied by the police department are very useful. We have another measure that we're looking at, which is from the fire department, which is the number of abandoned buildings on a block. We can do the same thing. We can geospatially tag every abandoned building. It turns out that's another measure that's very useful. And again, these kinds of measures, because the data is geotagged, allows us to look at a very hyperlocal. The question then is, how is it that crime, how is it that these abandoned uh, neighborhoods, how is that affecting health? They have to have a, a pathway. And what we're showing here is that um, the more violent crime incidents you have in your neighborhood, the worse your physical fitness. And that makes sense because if you're afraid of getting mugged or robbed or killed, you're not going to go walk to a grocery store for healthy food. You're not going to go walking at all. You're going to stay at home, especially at night. And in fact, anecdotally, that's what we hear from the older residents who are in the high crime areas is they tend to avoid going out and walking. And not surprisingly, that uh, reduces their fitness. And we know from our other studies that that is a, a really a key factor for Alzheimer's risk. Another direction uh, in collaboration with Patricia Fitzgerald Bocarsley in the uh, New Jersey Medical School of Immunology, who's also the provost, is to look at the immunological bases of Alzheimer's risk. There's a growing appreciation that Alzheimer's to some degree is an autoimmune disorder um, and that it may involve both the brain attacking good brain cells, but also not clearing out the toxins that are normally developed. And so with Pat, we're asking two questions. Do changes in immunological health across the lifespan, both inflammation, which is sort of the first, rep, the first phase of the immune system, and adaptive cells, such as T cells, how do these relate to the risk and progression of Alzheimer's disease? And secondly, and with some new funding we got over the last year from NIH, asking for those who were infected during the COVID-19 pandemic, what are the long-term consequences for brain health? And it's important to note that across the board, the risk factors for Alzheimer's and the risk factors for COVID mortality um, and severity are largely the same. Obesity, hypertension, diabetes, okay, being African-American, all of these are associated with higher risk for Alzheimer's and higher likelihood of mortality from COVID-19. And we don't think that that parallel is coincidental. Rather, we think it gets at the fact that, that uh, immune health may be critical part of Alzheimer's. Here's some, pre some preliminary data linking genetics, immune function, um, and, uh, and health. And APOE4 is the most common across all groups, uh, uh, risk factors for Alzheimer's. And again, we see that some of these relationships between the immune function um, and other factors really are, are, are present, are modulated by the genetics. So only in people with this risk variant of APOE do we see that higher levels of senescent cells, that's bad. So senescence is basically dead immune cells. The more dead immune cells you have, the higher levels of peak tau 181. That's a, a measure of the pathology. Similarly, we see in, in the middle graph that people who are among those who have this risk gene, people who are very fit tend to have low levels of senescence. So that's good. That suggests one question is perhaps part of the reason that fitness is so good for your brain Maybe it's from that middle graph. Maybe it says if you're at high genetic risk, that if you get very fit, you are reducing this, this senescence. You're redu reducing the number of dead cells. And lastly, um, back to obesity, uh, other high styles, we see there's a, a relationship between body mass and senescence. The heavier people are, and I should note that, by the way, you know, over half of our population is obese or clinically morbidly obese. The higher, the, 
the more obese people are, the, the worse their immune system is, the more dead immune cells there are. So these are some of the preliminary findings. Um, and again, we hope that this uh, turns into a, another larger project that keeps our grants office busy in the fall and the spring. One last question, who pays for this all? Um, so again, this, is, uh, this talk is hosted by our Office of, of Research at Rutgers, who we're very grateful for. Without any of you, there'd be no money. Uh, thanks to your efforts, um, we've raised since 2015 over seven and a half million dollars, um, most of it from NIH. Um, and as I mentioned, we have another, uh, we have two other grants pending, one for 4.7 million, which is in the final just-in-time stage um, that will launch a new clinical trial. And we have our competitive renewal at over $6 million, which would, which would fund our longitudinal study from 2003 up till, uh, I guess that would be 2008. Um, and that's, that was actually being reviewed today. Um, the peer review for that second grant is today. Uh, but anyway, thanks to all of, uh, a lot of people's efforts, including those of you in the research office, uh, we've been able to raise uh, significant funding, primarily from NIA for these studies. Um, we also are, are grateful to our board of brain health angels. So what are brain health angels? Well, these are our private donors um, that we raise money from. Um, and why, if we have all this NIH and other money, are, is this important? Well, this philanthropic support allows us to pursue quickly um, high impact, high risk new projects to get off the ground proof of concept preliminary results. Because uh, what we all know is that it takes a long time to get an NIH grant. Sometimes in our case, it's usually been three submissions before it gets funded. That's been our norm three times. Uh, get rejected twice, so it's a long time, and you need a lot of pilot data, okay? So in this way, philanthropic support is a lot like venture capital in the finance world, okay? You go to venture capitalists first, they get a, a, a company off the ground, and then later on, you go to uh, an IPO on the stock exchange, which is like the NIH to us. Um, we uh, are grateful to our synapse-level supporters who, support, who, who donate a 1,000 or more, our neuron-level supporters, 10,000 or more, and we're especially grateful to our higher cerebrum level supporters who, get, who donate 25,000 or more. And so it's through this effort that we get new projects, which in turn lead to larger, longer funding. So, uh, and of course, it's all tax deductible in case any of you want to make a donation. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. This, we have a lot of people in our lab working on research. Uh, we have an undergraduate honors students. Uh, we have a lot of post-baccalaureate people who are in an intermediate stage before their PhD or MD who are working with us. Graduate students from four departments working on this project. Postdoctoral fellows um, play a major role and many of you in the grants offices have dealt with the postdocs because each of our grants is sort of managed internally by a postdoc. And we have a number of junior faculty from neurology, social work, computer science, and public health, all of whom are using the infrastructure that we've built to begin to launch and grow their careers with other research projects relevant to their interests. So that brings me to the end. Uh, and I want to thank you. Um, all of the papers and other information is on our website. And uh, I welcome hearing from anyone by email. So thank you very much.